Um, you have a book on uh, polycystic ovary sy syndrome. Explain what that is, what some of the symptoms are and issues that, that can arise, because it sounds like it's wide ranging. It is, and the reason is that it gets back to the fundamental. So if you look at the way that women with PCOS can manifest with different symptoms, it looks, and it is, overwhelming because mm -hmm. they can have an entire array of metabolic issues. Where they, they're tending towards hypertension and insulin resistance and lipid abnormalities, fatty liver. Then they also have higher rates of mood disorders, anxiety, depression, irritable bowel syndrome. They tend to have hyperandrogenism, so they'll tend to have hair loss, or alopecia mm -hmm. on the top of their head, androgenic alopecia, often cystic acne in the lower part of their face, which totally recalcitrant to treatment, very, very difficult to treat, and facial hair, hirsutism, it's just what every woman wants. Look in the mirror, her hair is thinning, yeah. she's like balding in the, in the temples, and at the top of her you know, head, she's like thin hair. She has to shave every morning. She, they, they tend to be about 80% or overweight and obese with very, very resistant to weight loss. Mm. A lot of belly fat, fertility problems, complications with pregnancy. It's like, oh my gosh, what do they not have that they have to suffer with? It's, so then you think, how can that be? How can one person have such an array of problems right. in one body? it's because of estrogen. So I mentioned that estrogen is the master hormone of metabolic homeostasis. It, it's about energy, energy production, distribution. Well, it turns out that women with PCOS, this is very new understanding, a lot of people don't know anything about this, and they don't even know about estrogen in the first place, right? It's not well understood. But women with PCOS have a underlying genetic tendency to have difficulty, but it's mild. In, in a healthy woman, like an ancient woman, this has been around also for a very, very long time. They have a little difficulty in making estrogen in their ovaries. So the way that estrogen is made anywhere, and we'll talk about focus in the ovary, is from an androgen, like from testosterone. Mm -hmm. So in the ovary, the ovary makes testosterone in the thecalutein cells, then the testosterone transfers to the granulosa cells, all in the ovary, and with an enzyme that's present called aromatase. The testosterone is converted into estradiol, the dominant estrogen of reproductive age women. And then the estradiol goes out and it does all these wonderful things in the body. So women in ancient times, they had this, it was a very mild difficulty. So it actually turned out to be a survival advantage. Because if you think about it, women in ancient times, they had a very, very mild infertility. Not, they, they would have plenty of kids, but maybe instead of having seven, they would have four. That's yeah. a survival advantage hmm. because they had more time with each child. They had less potential for mortality from childbearing. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot out of a woman to have all those babies. It, yeah. you know, they, the babies pull the calcium, the iron, you know, so it mm -hmm. depletes them. So that was actually a survival advantage. They were a little subfertile, but they were not in any way sterile. And they had a little bit higher testosterone. Not enough so that they grew beards and lost their hair and all that. It wasn't that high. It was just a little bit. And that actually turns out also to be a survival advantage. That little bit of extra testosterone made them a little bit stronger bolder, braver, a little bit more dominant. And they've actually studied women who are Olympian champions. Mm -hmm. They have a higher rate of having PCOS. So, it's mm -hmm. a, you know, so now we took something that was a variation, a mild genetic difference, but what happens in modern society? Why is this epidemic and growing by leaps and bounds? Exposure to endocrine disruptors. So we already know they have a mild deficiency of estrogen, very mild. Now, you add in, and the, what's been most studied is BPA, bisphenol A, sure. ubiquitous, mm -hmm. plastics, cash register receipt, receipts, the internal lining of cans, it's just everywhere. Everybody has it. Mm -hmm. You have it, I have it. Mm -hmm. We can't escape it, it's all, but we have to try. <clears throat> we have to do the best we can. So it turns out that in utero, receptors are formed. Hormone receptors, everything's formed, right? Mm -hmm. You get one chance. Oh, you can't say, let's do a redo. Uh-uh, you get one chance to make a proper brain with proper receptors for hormones all over the body. 
So if you have endocrine disruptors present in utero, you can create abnormal receptor function. And that's what seems to be happening. Now we have studies that have been shown that women with PCOS have abnormal function of their estrogen receptors. They're like blocked. They're not working as well. So now we have a double whammy. We have a little bit less production. Now, that little bit less production is now being magnified into a greater dysfunction of production because of our diets are inflammation. So it turns out as well, ovaries are circadian. So, and the gut microbiome is circadian. Now what we're eating is, you know, we call it the standard Western diet or American diet, sad, standard American diet, very terrible. So you get this gut dysbiosis, the wrong bacteria, people are eating at the wrong times, their microbiome circadian rhythm is off. They're getting liver inflammation you're getting insulin resistance. Inflammation yields insulin resistance, tends towards diabetes. Circulating inflammation actually affects the ovaries. So now you have a double whammy on the ovaries. So the ovaries now are less functional in terms of making the estrogen. I mean, that's why women you know, who work at night, night shift women, mm -hmm. Um, they have much more problems with irregular cycles, fertility, you know, cancer. They have like the whole gamut of things. It sounds a lot like PCOS mm -hmm. because they have circadian rhythm dysfunction of their whole body, including of their ovaries. So now you have worsening circadian rhythm dysfunction of the ovaries. Estrogen is also, people don't know this, it actually is master of the circadian clock in the brain, the master clock that sits in what's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's a group of neurons that sits atop the optic nerve, has special sensors that go back from the eye just for the purpose of detecting light to let the master clock know when it's day and night. And it sort of sets the beat for the whole body. Well, women with PCOS have a circadian master clock that's drifting, sort of like a drunk conductor. It's like, you know, it keeps, you know, it's going like this, but not quite so right. Mm -hmm. So the beat is off. So now you have the beats off in the ovary, the beats off here, the beats off in all the organs. That's like the ticket to metabolic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So now you have a woman who is making too much testosterone because testosterone is the precursor for estrogen and the brain says, please, more estrogen, more estrogen, but it doesn't convert it properly. So the body builds up, it's sort of like an assembly line where you get a block and you build up something here. So you're yeah. building up too much testosterone. Inflammation actually creates more testosterone. That's why even women who don't have PCOS or are obese tend to have little beards that they grow and so they have more testosterone. So inflammation breeds even more testosterone. It's like everything sort of is a worsening thing. So you end up with this whole array of metabolic dysfunction, too little estrogen. So many women are t you know, or doctors talk about PCOS as estrogen dominant it's only estrogen dominant if you think, well, they don't have enough progesterone, but it gives, they actually are estrogen deficient. So it totally gives the wrong message. Also, I hate the word estrogen dominance because it makes so many people think estrogen is evil yeah. when estrogen is wonderful. Now, sometimes they talk about it and they're talking about endocrine disruptors, chemicals like BPA, mm -hmm. which you know, act on hormone receptors, but in a very bad way. That's not estrogen dominance, that's endocrine disruptor excessiveness, right? So we should call a spade a spade. Stop calling, calling anything estrogen dominance. If you don't metabolize estrogen properly because you have gut dysbiosis or an unhealthy liver, call it that. It's not estrogen dominance because estrogen is evil. So we got to get rid of that. And women with PCOS have estrogen deficiency, not estrogen excess. So they have this full array of problems. So what I have in my book is a approach to naturally restore the circadian rhythm, mm -hmm. the gut, their hormone production, and ultimately improve their fertility status and their quality of life and reduce their metabolic issues. So it's hard work, mm -hmm. it's lifestyle dominant, not pharmaceutical dominant, because the pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. that have been used for many decades already for women with PCOS in no way address the underlying root causes at all. Mm -hmm.